All right, I'll go ahead and start because um, entry is kind of slowed down a little bit. Um, we are recording, so we will make sure and send this out to everybody who did not um, was not able to get in or attend. But we want to welcome you tonight to our webinar on assistive technology for students with dyslexia, featuring Eric McGarty. McGarty, can you help me pronounce your McGarity. Name? Did I yeah. do it right the, the second time? The second time you did pretty good, McGarity. Okay. <laughs> but um, this presentation is sponsored by Dyslexia On, on Demand. Uh, we've been so excited to share this awesome information with so many people. Um, we have had up to a couple seconds ago, 245 registrations. Um, and we feel really fortunate to be responsible for putting all this information in the hands of a lot of people. So um, today is the first of our free webinar series called Beyond the Letters. And I welcome you to join our monthly newsletter where we'll announce other upcoming webinars on other valuable topics related to dyslexia. But a couple housekeeping items. Um, we are gonna keep everyone muted for easier facilitation of the webinar. We will have a Q&A session at the end of Eric's presentation. Um, and so please pray, place your questions in chat. Um, and then one of us facilitators will ask the questions for you at the end of the presentation. And we will ask questions as long as we have time um, with Eric. So we're thinking we might be able to manage between five and seven questions, possibly. It all depends on time. Um, uh, note again, this webinar is going to be recorded for you guys to review. If you want to go back, there's going to be so much valuable information. So if you're interested in kind of replaying it because you couldn't digest it all, or if you weren't able to attend last minute, um, just so that you know. But we will be sending it out tomorrow morning, along with just the information on our other webinars. All right. So I want to now introduce our speaker. So Mc Eric McGarity, he's the owner of Globe Runner, which is an award-winning digital marketing marketing firm out of Dallas. He's also a notable artist with several pieces displayed in prominent spots around the DFW area. And very important, very importantly, is the co-founder of Stand Up LD along with his wife Heather. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Stand Up LD is dedicated to fostering social and emotional health of students with learning, learning differences. And you guys are really in for a treat with Eric. Um, I heard Eric do a similar or the same presentation in January and was really blown away. And I immediately knew that he needed to kick off our webinar series. Um, I have heard so many assistive technology presentations as a Calt, um, and this one by far resonated so, so much deeper because it's shared from a first-person perspective of the tools that Eric uses to foster his own success daily. All right, so we are now going to play a short video from our sponsor, Dyslexia On Demand. Dyslexia On Demand is the premier provider of web-based one-on-one dyslexia therapy. We pride ourselves with connecting certified academic language therapists with students in need countrywide. Our philosophy is a child-focused one. We utilize regular standard score battery assessments to provide a prescriptive approach to therapy. Additionally, we offer at-cost dyslexia diagnosis testing for those without ready access to such opportunities. To learn more, please visit us at dyslexiaondemand.com. Um. Also, just a quick plug for our next Beyond the Letters webinar, which happens on June the 2nd, and it's on dyscalculia which is something that impacts so many of our kiddos, but there's so little information that's easily accessible. So you can also register for this webinar at dyslexiaondemand.com. And then final one, finally, if you're looking for some summer support for your kids with or without dyslexia, also please visit us at dyslexiaondemand.com to learn more about our summer offerings. All right, so now we're here for what we're ready for. Um, we've all um, signed in for, and we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Eric. Megan, thank you so much for the kind words and introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, let's jump right in. We've got a lot of good stuff to cover, and I am hoping to have some 
some good questions at the end. I uh, always enjoy uh, being able to field those. So uh, don't hesitate to drop those. I'll try to get to as many questions as we have time for. So um, let's start. So why am I here? Why am I here to talk to you? So this is me. Um, I was five years old when this photo was taken, which is the same year that I was identified with dyslexia. And, uh, you know, I was I was a happy go lucky kid, but um, being dyslexic was not an easy thing for me. And so, you know, once I got into school, I realized that I was different and that uh, school was a little bit more of a challenging place for me than it was for the other students. And I had to learn uh, eventually how to learn myself, how to teach myself, how to how to be a, an active learner. And we'll get to all that detail in a minute. But I remember my uh, my first grade teacher and she had no dyslexia um, training on how to how to teach kids with dyslexia. And, and as you guys all know, probably on this call, you know, like a lot of things in life, dyslexia is a spectrum. And I'm certainly on that extreme side of the ex of that spectrum as far as how much of a deficit in terms of just reading uh, dyslexia is for me, reading and spelling and those mechanical aspects. Um, I rem what's ironic is even the math concepts were challenging for me at the time, even though later in life, I became very uh, fascinated by mathematics. I ended up minoring in mathematics in college and I use math like on the daily in my job. I love to write formulas and, and it's it's something I really enjoy doing. So, um, but at the time I had a lot, a lot of trouble with basic arithmetic. So I remember uh, Mrs. Bush, would she was so frustrated. She didn't know how to teach me. She didn't know how to reach me as a student. And I think a lot of students struggle with that. I, um, clearly the world has progressed a lot, um, you know, in the last 40 years or, or you know, or so since I was five years old. But, um, you know, it's still a challenge is trying to figure out how to reach those students and how to connect with them. And hopefully I'll give you guys some tools today on how I've learned to be successful. And maybe some of those things are things that you can share with with your students or, or you know, your kids, depending on what brought you to the call today. So um, one of the places that I felt uh, safe in life was art class. Art class was always a place that I could shine. Uh, my natural creativity uh, uh, was on display and, and gave me the opportunity to, to really feel successful. And so my first career was as an artist. I uh, went on from, uh, I'll just to give you a little background on my academic career. Um, I went to private schools for the majority of my uh, middle school and, and high school experience. Here in the Dallas area, I went to the Shelton School, which is where my kids go today. And then I also went to uh, uh, Dallas Academy for high school because Shelton did not have a high school at the time. Of course, they do now. Um, and then uh, I was able to go to UNT uh, for undergraduate. I majored in I'm sorry, I went to uh, University of Ozarks for my undergraduate, majored in art, and then I also had a double minor, one in philosophy and one in mathematics. And then I was able to go on to graduate school and complete an MFA in sculpture. And so my first career was as a full-time artist and a college professor until years later when I started my business. And we'll talk about that some in the presentation. So I have a few sculptures I wanna show you because the, the majority of the work that I did revolved around my experience as a dyslexic. So this piece is called Collision of a Fourth Grader. And it's a little tough to see in the photo, but it's a desk that is bent out of shape and kind of flattened up against the wall. And it, it appears to almost have collided into the wall. And of course, it's painted in school bus, school bus uh, yellow and black. And then above it are yellow books that are uh, cemented into black concrete blocks. And below it is, I think about 3000 pencils uh, to kind of form that triangular shape. And so this really illustrates to me the experience that, it, that a dyslexic myself felt in the classroom. It was an experience of being out of control. And I think that's one of the most challenging things when you're in a classroom environment 
and you just don't feel like you're in control and it's moving faster than you're ready for it. Information's coming to you in ways that you're not able to consume and you, you, you feel very powerless. And for me in my life, many of the decisions I've made and when I was most successful in academics and, and, you know, and later in graduate school and in college, which I, I did very well in both of those, um, it was because I learned how to take control over my learning environment. And, and we'll get into some detail on how I did that. This is another one. This one's a little more visceral on the uh, the schooling uh, comfort level. I think uh, I really didn't, I didn't even like the way the desk felt like you. You always felt like you were sliding out, you know, sliding out from under it. I don't know why. Um, but the the desk was this kind of thing that I always wanted to get away from um, and feeling very out of place in that situation. So let's talk about getting into get, gaining some control. And so this was the summer, I think the summer before fifth grade. And my parents had enrolled me in Shelton and they wanted me to go to summer school. And the school, of course, wanted me to do uh, intensive reading therapy for half of the day. And uh, which, you know, makes sense for the school. Of course, I have another word for it. I call that torture. And I was not looking forward to this summer of reading therapy at all. And as a reward, my parents signed me up for art class. And I was very excited in this you know, I already had um, shown a great interest in art and and just loved loved to make things, loved to be creative. And uh, so I was very excited about the art class. So, of course, the first day of school, uh, some kids and I were playing kickball and I fell off of a fence trying to retrieve the ball and I broke my right arm very badly. And I ended up in a, in a full arm cast that covered my hand and only the little tips of my fingers you could see out of the out of the cast and I couldn't pick up a pencil I couldn't pick up a paintbrush uh and my my dreams of doing art that summer felt dashed at the time so I went into the art class and I remember I sat down and Mary Dallas it was the name of the uh art teacher and she came up to me and she said Sarah what are you doing why aren't you doing the you know assignment I showed her my hand. I said, Oh, I can't hold a pencil. I can't draw anything. I said, you know, don't worry. I'm, I'm a good kid. I won't bother anybody. I'll just sit here quietly. Um, it'll be fine. And she said, no, Eric, you're an art class. You're a creative dude. We're going to do art together. And she didn't know me. This was the first class I had had with her. And she, she said, what were, she said, um, what do you think people that have physical disabilities do? How do they do art? And my first answer is, well, I don't think they do art if they can't hold the paintbrush. How could they paint? And she said, well, if you have a physical disability, you learn another way, right, to be creative. And so maybe you'll hold the paintbrush in your mouth. She says there's artists who don't have arms, their arms end at their elbows, but they've learned to uh, pinch, a, pinch the paintbrush in their elbows. Maybe they do, uh, you know, sculpture with their feet. So it, she says it's amazing what people are able to do because they have a drive to be creative and they have a drive to express themselves. And she said, that's what we'll do for the rest of this year. We're going to do art without using our hands. And that's exactly what I did. And it was so fun. I mean, I had the best time. I, I you know, I held, you know, markers and paints with my mouth. We did foot drawings uh, did just everything we could think of. Every day was a creative exploration of how do we make something cool today without using our hands. And it was so fun that the other kids in the class wanted to do it with me, even though they didn't have any issues. They were excited about this idea. And so we ended up having this great summer of exploration and learning how to do art without using our hands. And for me, it was this life lesson where I said, gosh, if, if I can do art without with a broken arm, that's not going to stop me from, from doing art. Being dyslexic shouldn't stop me in life. I don't know if I had that exact aha moment at the time, but that I kept going back to that experience as one where I realized that I had to take control. I had to learn how I was going to be successful. 
And that was a big moment in, in my life. And uh, Mary Dallas and I stayed in touch for years. Um, she's passed away now, but we were we were in touch for for many, many years after I finished middle school, because I just thought she's such a wonderful woman and such a great influence in my life. Um, this piece is called Repetition uh, of Unreadable Books, and it is one of the first pieces that I did that I really feel like was a breakthrough piece for me. This was uh, 98 books cast in concrete blocks, uh, you know, literally unreadable. Um, they're all stuck in those blocks. And it's it's a it's a library of unreadable books or it's a, a cemetery to the books, however you want to see it. But for me, it was a way to show people very viscerally the experience of seeing the book and wanting to get the information, but not being able to. And uh, so this was kind of kind of set my trajectory, if you will, as an artist. Later on, my work continued to develop and I started doing steel pieces where I wanted the books to express themselves because one of the interesting parts about being dyslexic is this desire to, to read, right? The desire to want to get information out of those books. And um, so I would always go into a library and I just, I, I still love to go into a library and just look through the stacks and see what's there. I'm not going to read those books. I still don't read books uh, with my eyes to this day, but uh, I love going and just checking out what's there and maybe finding a book that is is more of a picture book or something that I, I find interesting or a diagram of something. Um, but I love that experience. So I wanted the books to have an energy to them, kind of like express themselves, almost like they were exploding out, but still restricted. So in this piece, the books are caged up uh, with these steel cages. Another piece that I did was uh, a piece called Integrated Notions. And really appreciate this one. You have to know my, I heard you say that you're doing a talk on dyscalculia in the next podcast. Well, my wife has dyscalculia. We actually met uh, in, in University of Ozarks. They have a learning center um, that's for LD students. And we met during freshman orientation at the Learning Center because we were both LD students doing the orientation together. And I saw her and I was like, I was hooked right away. I knew we were going to end up together. It took her a little longer to figure it out, but, you know, I knew. Um, so we, uh, this was after we had already, uh, I think we were married at this point. And she came home one day and she had this big calculus book. And I, you know, of course, knew that she had dyscalculia and there was no way that she would buy a calculus book for herself. And I'm finished with college at this point. And I said, well, what's the book all about? And she said, oh, I bought this for you. I want you to make it into one of your sculptures so no one can read it again. <laughs> so I said, all right, of course. So I took the book, but because I love math so much, I decided I wanted the book to really uh, inform what the sculpture was going to be. So in this case, you know, it's very geometric. It's almost like the, the calculus formula is, is being expressed three dimensionally out of the book. Um, but at the same time, I met my wife's criteria of closing that book forever, uh, so that it, it would never be read again. Um, I, I love this fact. So, uh, 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic or identify themselves as dyslexic, and only 10% of the population. And I, I think that's such a fat, fantastic fact that we've got this, this really heavy concentration of uh, dyslexics in the entrepreneurial world. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I want to go through a few of my, my thoughts. Um, one of them is, as an entrepreneur, you are in control of your own destiny. And as I mentioned at the top of the talk, Feeling that sense of feeling out of control is one of the biggest challenges as a young dyslexic. And being an entrepreneur allows me to build a company in which I can put myself in a, in a position where I'm successful. The other thing is I found in, in my conversations with other successful adult um, dyslexics, commonly uh, we describe a very similar sense of being able to think around a problem and be an intuitive problem solver. And I think that is, is a unique quality 
that dyslexics are very good at. And I'm not sure if that's a, a genetic or if that's something that's that's practiced, uh, if it's trained because of the challenges with reading. But whatever the case is, I find that very commonly uh, dyslexics will describe that they have that gift of being able to intuitively solve problems and get to answers very quickly where other people kind of have to linearly go through that problem. And uh, so that lends itself well to entrepreneurship, that, that skill. The other, and so this is my business, Globe Runner, that I founded. So I actually started Globe Runner 15 years ago. Um, so we've been we've been at this a while, and and it's it's been you know very successful for myself and my family. So I'm very glad I made that decision. Um, and you know, but I go back and I think about the kid that I was, even in college or grad school. And I had this impression that I could never be successful in the business world because I felt like the business world would require me to read constantly and put me in a situation that uh, really set me up for failure. And I was very intimidated by that. And that's one of the reasons that I went to grad school. I thought if I went to grad school, I could at least teach and be a art professor and I did, I did do that so that I was successful in that venture, but uh, I never was uh, comfortable with, with going into the business world. It wasn't until my wife encouraged me and she said, she sat me down one day. I was frustrated with some things that were happening in my art career. I had a gallery that represented me and the gallery um, uh, director and, and she was just really tough on me and no, she didn't like my new work and I was frustrated with her and I lost a big show that I was excited about. And uh, so I was upset. And she said, Eric, if you spent half of the drive and energy that you've put into trying to build your art career um, in the business world, you would make a million dollars. And it just was a light bulb moment for me. I said, maybe I should do that. And that was the impetus to starting my first business which then later became Globe Runner. Uh, it wasn't Globe Runner at the offset. And I sat down and I just, I learned how to be successful as an entrepreneur with no formal training in, in business or entrepreneurship or finance or any of the things that um, I now consider myself uh, somewhat of an expert in all of those things. Uh, I just did it more through sheer gumption and desire uh, to make it work. So this idea of growth mindset is so incredibly important to me. And I think it's something that is incredibly important that we pass this idea to our, our kids and our students that the mind, uh, it comes from neuroplasticity, that the mind can actually alter itself and the mind can create new connections and ways. And you can give yourself new abilities. So, you know, you may say, well, I'm not very good at X. Well, okay, maybe not today, but we can learn to be good at X and we can learn new skills. And it's such a powerful idea. One of the reasons that, you know, a lot of people do standardized tests like the IQ test and the SAT and all these standardized tests. And most dyslexics generally don't do as well as they would like to do on those tests. And I feel like it's mentally limiting to put a number on, on yourself, right? Um, I, I took an IQ test and I really didn't even, I didn't want to know what I got. I was like, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Um, Cause I felt like it would, it would mentally, it would cap my ability, right? I knew I was smarter than whatever I got. Um, I ended up, I did fine on the test. They ended up telling me much to me, my chagrin, I didn't want to know, but um but it was just, it was one of those things that I felt like this will, this will stop me from growing mentally. And I know I'm capable of infinite growth. And I still believe that to this day. I think that we all are, if we put our minds to it, we can grow our, our abilities. Another thing that I found that helped me in life was the ability to collaborate and build teams. And this is one of the reasons that I think I've been successful as an entrepreneur. And this is a special gift that I have as a dyslexic. And when I was young, 
early on, I realized that I had to find the team to put together to help me be successful in the classroom. And, you know, that could be, um, you know, winning over the teacher. One of the things that I learned, uh, particularly in high school and later in college, was I would sell the teacher on me. That was one of my major goals, was to make sure that teacher knew that I was engaged, I was interested in the subject, I was ready to uh, talk about that subject. And so every single class I've ever attended, pretty much, um, after that first or second lecture, I go up at the end of class and have a conversation with the teacher, um, usually to advocate to them and talk to them about my dyslexia, but also to engage with them about the lecture, say something that I, you know, ask a, an, an intelligent question about what they had, what they had talked about during that class. And I'd make a habit of going up at the end of class and talking to the teacher. It was just a way to make sure that they knew that I was smart and engaged. So when I did need help, I could go to help and they would, they would actually be very willing to help me instead of going, gosh, this guy's lazy, you know, so important, such a, a wonderful skill to have. The other thing that um, I was able to do is identify students that could help me. If I needed notes taken, I'd figure out who I thought had good notes and I'd go see how to, how, if I could get a copy of their notes and things like that. So the last piece of this is I knew that I wasn't going to be the best at everything that the company needed to be able to do. And one thing that I've noticed a lot of really smart people do, um, my dad's a great example of this. My dad's a, he's a brilliant man. And he pretty much thinks that he's the best at just about everything he touches. And he's, he's right more often than not, but he would struggle to build a business with other people because he would pretty much just do everything himself and wouldn't be able to scale beyond his own abilities. I knew instantly before I even started the business that I was going to pull people together and make a team. And my goal was to have a team and not a, not be a solo practitioner. That was a, a number one goal of mine when I started the company. And uh, I was successful in doing that. Um, I'll show you, actually. Here's a, a photo a couple of years ago of, of the team. This was actually right before COVID. I gave up this office. We used to have this nice office. Now we work from home. But um, so this is a photo we took right before COVID hit. So that idea of pulling together the team, but when I first started, I'll tell you guys this story. Uh, I think I've got enough time. Uh, we, um, we, I, I said, okay, I want to have a team, but I have no money. So how do I get a, a team together without, you know, incurring a payroll? And so I had some relationships with some independent contractors, uh, a couple, a couple web developers, a uh, social media person, um, a, a freelance writer, um, and, you know, a couple people like that. So I pulled them all together. I said, Hey, I'm starting this company globe runner. Would you be willing to do work? If I got a client, would you be excited about doing the work? And they were like, yeah, sure. If you get a client, we'll work for you. And so I paid them a little bit to help me put together the website and all that jazz. And then the next thing I did is I went and posted an ad on Craigslist. This dates us a little bit, tells you when, you know, when I started the company, um, but I posted an ad on Craigslist and I hired five salespeople to work hundred percent commission for me. And so before I had my first customer, I had a team of 10 people. And that was a really important part of my journey as an entrepreneur was to create that, that momentum of the, of the business. And, and it worked. I went out and sold my first customer and, and the fact that I had a team gave me the legitimacy to have that business sign up with and actually commit to paying me a monthly fee. So that was really an important part of my strategy. So that brings us to being resourceful, right? What I just told you is an example of how I was resourceful and, and built a business that was much larger to my, than myself uh, with no money and, and just got the, got the wheel rolling. Um, but in learning, resourcefulness is very important, too. So one of the things that I commonly struggle with is spelling a specific word. Now, of course, it's gotten easier today. Grammarly is an amazing tool. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, 
I remember writing an email and I wanted to find the word curious. And this was, this was a number of years ago. And I really wanted to write the word curious. Well, curious is a incredibly hard word to spell. And anybody that's not dyslexic probably can think about it for a second and remember how to spell it. And, and it's just, it doesn't follow any rules. It's not phonetic. It's, it's a tough word. And, but I wanted to include the word curious in this document I was creating. So the first thing I did, so I typed it out in Microsoft Word and I tried the drop down of suggestions. And of course, it, Microsoft Word could not suggest the right answer because I wasn't even anywhere in the universe of the right answer. And um, so I used my number one spelling strategy and I would encourage any dyslexic to use this spelling strategy and it's to add more vowels. It usually works. <laughs> This is a hack for getting a spell checker to figure out what you're trying to say. Just add enough vowels and it usually will figure it out. Um, unfortunately, in this situation, it did not work. No matter how many vowels in what parts of the word I added them, it would not get the word curious for me. So then I went to Google and I thought, well, maybe Google will figure it out. If Microsoft can't do it, Google can do it. So I typed in curious in Google. No luck. So then I had the aha moment, and I think you probably know where I'm going. I was like, curious George, type it into Google, this will work. George is a really hard word to spell. So here we were back at the beginning. Now I'm sitting here banging my head against George, adding more vowels, doing all the things. Couldn't figure it out. Um, so I'm kind of stuck there for a second. And then I got resourceful and I said, if I Google man with a yellow hat, curious George and a man with a yellow hat is the first thing that comes up. Copy the word curious into my document and move on. So yeah, maybe that took me 15 minutes where it would have taken anybody else 30 seconds to write the word curious, but I got what I needed done, right? So part of resourcefulness is, is being determined, being hard headed. I could have probably come up with some other word that I could spell, but I really thought that that was the right word for the document I was writing, and it was worth the effort to me. Um, so those are the qualities that I think build lifelong success. One of the messages I hope you take away from this is I think LD is, is just as much of a gift as it is a setback. And I think the, the abilities that I see in other uh, dyslexics um, far outweigh the challenges that we deal with as, as youngsters. One of the ways we're going to talk about is assistive technology. I'm getting there uh, to, to remove some of those challenges. So let's get into it. So first off, what is reading? So obviously in school, the younger you are, the more emphasis is on the fundamentals of reading, spelling, reading a clock, uh, you know, doing your memorization of your math tables. A lot of that is, is focused on rote memorization, which is an area that uh, I have always really, really struggled in. So a lot of those basic skills were very hard. Interestingly, when you get to more advanced academic fields, um, I excel at those because they're more about thinking and pulling together disparate ideas and synthesizing uh, a more complex concept. And I love that. That's exciting to me. But the, the mechanics that we have to learn as kids is really challenging. So I would challenge you to rethink what you think reading is. If you were teaching a blind student, you would never ask them to eye read. Instead, you would teach them how to read with braille. And they're, instead of using their eyes, they're using their sense of touch. So we're, it's still reading though. I don't think anyone would ever argue that braille is not reading. And I would argue that audiobooks in the same light are just as much reading as I reading is. And I have gotten a tremendous amount of value in my life out of ear reading. And I am a very proficient and prolific ear reader. Uh, I started ear reading as a very young child. My parents signed me up for a recording for the blind and dyslexic, which is now called Learning Ally. And I got the books on tape that they sent I started reading those, uh, I don't actually know how old I was. I was probably eight or nine, I'm guessing, maybe 10. And I read books 
constantly and avidly. Um, and that has been a lifelong thing for me. And I love listening to audiobooks. And to this day, I use my computer to read everything aloud to me. So you can be very successful in life and in academics if you work on being a great ear reader. And being a great ear reader, just like being a great eye reader, takes practice and it takes learning how to um, comprehend. So there's a lot of skill sets there that are very important to learn and teach to students because ear reading, just because they can hear the words doesn't mean that they're really comprehending the words. And uh, so it's, it's a, it takes practice just like, just like eye reading does. So um, let's talk about building ramps. Once again, just to reinforce that idea, I feel like assistive technology is a ramp. We want our students to be able to eye read and I think a lot of the folks on this call probably are professionals and spend a lot of time helping uh, students learn how to eye read. And I'll tell you, I want my kids who are all uh, dyslexic to eye read just as much as anybody, but I help them ear read at the meantime because I want them to have access to information more than I want them to eye read at this very moment. But we spend a lot of time working on eye reading. With that said, the ramp is so important. I would never ask somebody in a wheelchair to climb the stairs. Same idea with dyslexia. We wanna work on eye reading when it's appropriate, but in any classroom environment that is not an eye reading class, i.e. not your reading therapy class, for instance, history or science or, or, or uh, literature or any of those other things, we want to give that student as much access to assistive technology and audiobooks as possible so that they can learn how to learn rather than their learning being metered by their eye write, reading ability. And I, that's one of my pet peeves. I see it a lot where we'll have students in a classroom environment and they're trying to learn history and they're supposed to read a passage and then write a the facts that they learned. Well, in many cases, it's just because the teacher isn't really thinking through how to give that student an audible access, but you're really limiting their ability to learn history to their weakest skill, which is their ability to eye read. And that for me is, is a real shame because that student might really enjoy history. So first off, audiobooks. So lots of great services out there for audiobooks. Um, I have used most of the ones I'm showing on the screen. So Learning Ally, as I said, used to be recording for the blind and dyslexic, and I was a power user of that service. Uh, wonderful service. I actually got a chance to uh, work for Recording for the Blind and Dyslexic as their national spokesperson um, about uh, 17 years ago. And it was really fun. Got to travel all over the country and give talks to school groups and uh, really enjoyed working with them. So what a great group. Uh, Bookshare is, and and so Learning Ally, one of the things, if you're not familiar with it, Learning Ally provides um, audiobooks. And one of the things they do really well is they make sure to have the latest textbooks read onto audio. So the school books that are actually assigned by the school systems, specifically public school systems, they will have them ready for that school year so that your student can actually read the, the textbook that they're supposed to be reading. Um, they use volunteer human readers. Bookshare uh, is a little different. They provide the uh, digital text copy of the books, and then they recommend several different apps that will allow you to listen to the book with a computerized voice. So quality is not as good, but I will say with AI voices, that is changing rapidly. An AI voice today is actually very good. You can get some incredible results that you could never have gotten when I started listening to computerized voices. For younger students, Epic is a really nice service for reading um, fun books with kids. Um, the free option, your local library for, for just good old reading of literature is a great one. Uh, Play Away is at least what they have in the local libraries near me, and it's a free sir, free free option to get audiobooks. Uh, and then the last one is Audible.com, of course, everybody's familiar with. 
that's what I use most today as a professional because I can get business books and I can get, you know, science fiction and fantasy books or whatever it is I'm interested in reading. And they're very, very high quality and professionally produced. Um, I just read uh, 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 Born Standing, which was uh, Steve Martin's uh, kind of life life journey uh, through stand up comedy. And he read it himself and it was really nice and a great, great read, fun, fun book to read. Uh, some interesting stories and obviously a great comedian. So uh, lots of good, lots of good stuff there. Then dictation. So getting information onto text is also a challenge. I've already talked to you guys about how challenging it is to spell words like curious. So I today in business, I dictate 99% of the content that I write. I use dictation to do that. And it is so much faster for me. What's interesting is most of my employees and even customers will see me dictating and realize how efficient it is. And they've started switching over to it, even though they don't have any LD at all. They just are realizing that it's more efficient than, than, than typing everything. So I'm going to go through real quick. And I'll stop sharing my slideshow and show you guys actually how to turn some of these things on. So I use a Mac. Um, if you're in the market for a computer, I recommend a Mac because they have done a much better job with accessibility being a built-in feature into their computers. And I say this with much chagrin because I was a hardcore PC user for years and years and years, I would never touch a Mac. And finally, somebody, another friend of mine who is an LD adult convinced me, he said, you really should switch. And I switched and it was hard for me because all the buttons were in different places. But now that I'm used to it, I, you know, it, I'm never going back. I'm, I'm, it was a really good decision. So the Macs have a lot of things built in. So I'm going to show you on the Mac how to turn some of these things on. So first, dictation. So dictation, interestingly, is not considered an accessibility feature. It is considered a keyboard. So um, let's see. We're going to go to, yeah, we're going to go to keyboards right here. And inside, they always change, change everything, but here it is. So here's our dictation um, menu right here as part of keyboards, which I think that's brilliant, right? What we're doing is we're getting information into the computer and onto the page. So whether you type it, you handwrite it, or you dictate it, you are achieving the goal of getting information onto the page. And that for me is, is an important concept because what we want is we want students to be able to craft compelling written documents. And once again, dictate dictation, you know, whether it's dictated or typed doesn't really matter because uh, what we're trying to do is craft that document. So here's how you turn on the dictation feature. Dictation. Right, right here. And then you can, um, let's see, what was the other feature? Oh, the other thing that I always recommend is setting up a keyboard shortcut to turn on and off your dictation. And you'll see that I use uh, Command W. You can use whatever you want. Pick a keyboard shortcut that isn't used for something else, right? And uh, for me, that's kind of ergonomically easy for me to, to press that with my fingers. But it can be anything. And that allows you to turn it on and off your dictation feature and very easily start dictating something. So I'll go into, let's just go into the document or actually, let's just go into a Google search and I could, you know, just dictate. Uh, oh, it doesn't want to dictate it for me because I'm on a Zoom call, I think. Dyslexia training. There we go. Now I got it. So it's just really easy. And I just used a keyboard shortcut to turn on that feature. So back to the presentation. The other thing I want to talk about is another way to turn on dictation. If you don't have a Mac, or even if you do, Google Docs is a brilliant way to do dictation. So here in Google Docs, Google Docs is free, which is beautiful in and of itself. 
I can go into the tools menu and I select voice typing. So just take a second, write that down. I open a new Google Doc, I go into the tools menu and I select voice typing and it brings up this little floater uh, with a mic on it. And then I can start dictating anything I want, comma. The accuracy on this is actually significantly better than other software tools. I mean, look at that. I'm not even using the headphones, right? I mean, it, but I think I did pretty good. Let's find out if I did good. Let's listen to it. And then I can start dictating anything I want. The accuracy on this is actually significantly better than other software tools. Oh, I did well. Look at that. So how do I check my dictation? I use my text-to-speech, which I'm going to talk about in a second, to actually check my own work. This is a strategy that I teach any student I ever work with, is to dictate and then listen to what you just typed. Dictation will make mistakes, and it's great to be able to listen to it and have that immediate feedback sentence by sentence. As I write out my sentences, I listen to them, and then I, then I know that I, I did them correctly. So as I promised, text-to-speech. So how do we turn on text-to-speech? So I go into the system setting menu and I come up here and I type in accessibility. There it is. Um, with, a, with a C instead of an S. And then I go to um, speak spoken content. So I'll show that again. So you've got here in the vision category, they've got spoken content. And this is where I can turn on uh, speak selected. So what this allows me to do, you'll see I have speak selection right here. That's the only thing that you'll want to turn on is speak selection. These other features are, are more for full screen reading for somebody who maybe uh, you know needs needs everything written read out for them. But speak select is what you want. Once again, you want to set up a keyboard shortcut to uh, play uh, sel the selection based on your keyboard shortcut. And then you can change the speed of the dictation or of the playback and the volume, of course. And then you can select different voices based on your personal preference. And so I'll you, you saw me do that just a second ago, but I can do that on you know any website, which is great. So if I'm on this website, and I wanna read this particular sentence. I can just hit my keyboard shortcut on my keyboard. The course was developed in coordination with faculty from the University of Texas at Austin Meadows Center, as well as Lima University. Further, the course was reviewed and approved by the SBEC approved panel of experts. And, and I've, now I've been able to read that. And I will actually adjust the speed of the playback depending on what I'm trying to do. If I'm editing my own work, I usually play it at a, at a normal speaking speed because I wanna make sure I catch any nuanced uh, word that may have been wrong. If I'm trying to read a New York Times article and I, I, I just wanna get through it and it's long, then I'll play, turn up the playback speed all the way and I'll just crank, crank through it. And you're probably familiar with that on Audible or something, you can change the playback speed and some books you may wanna listen to you know, at normal human speech, but some you'd want to listen to quicker. And I find that to be a real gift, particularly in college. So in college, you're going to get assigned a significant amount of reading homework. And the uh, the normal college kid can read about 300 words a minute. Well, we speak, depending on what part of the country you live in, at about 120 words a minute. So you can see that that's, you know, a lot slower than a college student reads. So you can imagine if you were just assigned to do uh, two hours of reading, but you're reading it at 120 words and all your classmates are reading it at 300 words. For them, it's two hours of homework. For you, it's five hours of homework. So really nice to be able to crank up that playback speed once you've trained yourself to listen at a, at a faster volume. And that's one of the things I was saying is audio processing and audio um, reading, if you will, or reading with your ears is, is a skill to be trained. And particularly as you start improving the speed at which you can listen, 
and still comprehend, uh, it's going to be an advantage, particularly in college or, or in high school, when the reading volume is great enough that that time difference between 120 and 300 words actually really makes a significant impact in the length of your homework assignment. All right. So the next one, if you want to go for a more premium option, is Speechify. So Speechify is a uh, AI-driven text-to-speech app. I think it's $10 a month. It's very inexpensive. But they have very, very high quality voices that sound like a real person talking to you. So uh, if you're not worried about the $10 a month fee, that might be something to look into as well. Then you can have Gwyneth Paltrow read your homework to you, right? Uh, so or or Snoop Dogg, whatever, you know, floats your boat. And it's it's really quite a cool service and, and very, very well done, well made, well made product. Um. Another product that I think is really good for school age kids is Read and Write uh, by Google. So it's a Google product. And one thing that it does a little differently that is an advantage, particularly for, for schoolwork, is you can draw a box around the text you want. And if, for instance, the text is in an image, it'll still read it. It has built-in optical character recognition. And so it can turn that image into readable text. And I found, particularly with my kids getting homework assignments, a lot of the time the teacher will give them a, a handout. And, you know, like, let's say, I don't know, I have this thing right here. Great. A perfect example. They'll give them a handout, and the handout's kind of in a format like this. Well, this is not set up well for assistive technology. Very hard to read. But Read and Write Gold they can just draw a rectangle around the area of content they want read, and then it'll it'll recognize the words and it'll read it out loud. So for school assignments, I find this to be a, a really good software. Um, the next one I recommend for people of all ages, you're probably all using this already, is Grammarly. What an awesome tool. Game changer, just make, makes it so much easier to get your commas all in the right place, It'll tell you if your sentence structure is a little awkward, helps you with your spelling. It's a very intuitive system. I, I all my employees are required to use it. Uh, if they have, if they ever write emails to clients, they have to use Grammarly. So a great, great tool. Uh, it's free if you're not a power user, and it's it's I think it's ten fifteen dollars a month if you use it a lot. I I, I use it a lot. So. Um, Another tool I highly recommend is Otter AI. This is the note-taking tool on steroids. So this is a great tool for recording lectures. I went ahead and started recording this very meeting so you guys could see it in progress. So this is Otter AI in real time taking notes from this very meeting, which is super cool. And it's been taking notes the whole time we've been talking. And you can see it's broken up here. Now, one thing that's cool is it'll go back later and split that up into separate people speaking. So if you have two or three people in a conversation, let's say, um, uh, this, is this a good example? No, let's do, let's do this one. All right. So it'll write a summary of the conversation that I had. And then it'll also give me the whole transcript of the conversation. And it shows me the name of the speaker. So, you know, here's me, here's Brennan. And so if I want, and I'm, I want to get the full detail, I can actually click I'm into it. Up wanting something that was one piece, right? So I ended up and I could hear Brennan actually saying the original transcript. So it's great. I can go through here and find the part that I want to get into and then click in and actually hear that person say those words. I just love this. I think this would have been a game changer, you know, in, in high school and college, every lecture I would, I would, you know, get permission to record. Or if I had this tool, I would have gotten permission to record. And this would have been an amazing way to get those notes at a very, very high level. So Otter AI is awesome. Uh, it, it does have a fee to it. Um, I believe it's a hundred dollars a year. Um, so not too bad and well worth it if you're needing to take notes in school. 
All right, let's talk about some mobile tools. So just like, let me start my slideshow again. Just like with the computer, you can turn on uh, both dictation and text-to-speech on your phone. And so this is the menu walkthrough for how to get it turned on on your phone for text-to-speech. So you go into general, uh, this is on an iPhone. You go into general, then accessibility, then uh, speak speech, and then you select uh, speech selection. Same thing, you can control the, uh, the pace of the talk. And then you can highlight text and it'll where, I don't know if you guys have an iPhone, but if you highlight some text, it'll usually like add the thing to underline or to copy paste. It'll add the word speak into that menu and then you can click it and it'll play it out loud to you. And I'm sure you all already know that you can dictate your text messages. Um, it's one of the wonderful things that an iPhone has. And so now that's part of the built-in menu. You don't even have to turn it on. Um, so dictation is so, so smooth today with iPhones. And so I find that to be a, a really nice way to uh, get information down. Even if even if I'm just brainstorming, I'll pull up a notes app and and just dictate in some something. Um, another thing you can do if you want is open up the Google Drive app, start a Google Drive document. You can dictate into it on your iPhone and then open it later on your computer to edit it. And so I find that a really nice way to get a document started. I can get it started on the go on my mobile phone. And then when I get back to my computer, I can listen to the text easier and then I can edit it and format it and make it look pretty and then you know get that turned in later. So just some neat little hacks you can do there. This is another one of my favorites. So this app is called Prismo Go. I actually use this all the time just for life. And it's it takes a photo and it does optical character recognition on the fly. And then it has a read button and it will play the text out loud uh, for you on the fly. It is a very, very cool app. It's 100% free. It was designed for dyslexics. And it's it's a really great tool. So I'll use that all the time um, to, you know, it's especially good back to this worksheet scenario. So the worksheets commonly, you know, come home for school and they're they're not formatted in a way that I can easily get them onto the computer. So Prismo Go, I'll just take a photo of the sections of the worksheet where it has the instructions and listen to that. And then I'll tell, you know, or I'll work with my my kids and I'll I'll pull out my phone. I'm like, all right, well, let's read these instructions and we'll do it together. I'll photograph it and we'll listen to it, talk about what they need to do and then do the work. Or the older my older kids have it on their phone and they can do that themselves. So I highly recommend this tool. It's an awesome, awesome Texas speech app that is free and, and really great. Um, Easy spelling aid is another cool one. This will, if you're working with a student or your kids, or this is particularly for homework, and you're trying to get them to uh, learn some handwriting, you can click the mic. They can dictate whatever they're wanting to write into the into the mic, and then you can choose how you want that typed out. And so, for instance, you could have it in cursive. And it'll write it in cursive. And then when they're doing their handwriting assignment, they can copy that cursive um, cursive down. Or if they're trying to learn how to read in cursive, they can do that as well. So we use this a lot with my daughter when she was young. All right. So I know I'm running a little low on time. Am I supposed to, or we're good? We're okay? All right. I won't rush too much then. Um, so study aids, let's talk about study aids. Honestly, ChatGPT is my favorite study aid. I have just blown away how cool this is. And I wanted to show you a real life example. So my um, my son is a junior in high school and he's in algebra two. And I mentioned I love math, but it's been a long time since I took algebra two, a really long time. And so he was like, dad, help me with my homework. And I'm looking at it going, uh, okay, how do I do that? I can't quite remember. And so I went to chat GPT and, you know, we, here was, you know, all about polynomial polynomials. And I asked, let's see, what did I ask it? Um, 
how would you answer this question? Okay, I, I needed to, we were doing some graphing of formulas and it helped me understand how to do graphing, gave me a really good explanation of everything. Then we did some examples. Um, we did, let's see, this is another one. I mean, you can see that was a lot of homework we did, but all of these were example problems, right? And the, what we weren't trying to do was get ChatGPT to do the work for us. What we were trying to do instead was to get examples of how to do the work so that I could walk him through the problem. And uh, I just found this to be so helpful. Now, of course, there is a risk of cheating with ChatGPT. Certainly, I'm sure an issue in schools, but for a study aid and a learning aid, it is, it is an incredible, incredible tool. I use it a lot for work as well, um, for helping me to write formulas, for helping to write, um, uh, I use it for coding. I can write code uh, snippets with it. Um, it's just an amazing tool. So a lot of fun. And, and I use it a lot too for creative writing. So uh, we do a lot of fun things. You know, my kids and I do a lot of creative things. So we'll, I did a murder mystery with ChatGPT. And we created a whole murder mystery party. Um, can help me come up with all the characters, help me write everybody's backstory so I could hand them a backstory. And they had a fully written out backstory. And so all the kids came to the party. They all had backstories. They all had secrets and clues. They all interconnected. Um, you know, it was the type of thing that normally you go to the store and you know, it costs you $30 to buy a box kit with everything. And I wrote it with chat GPT and had a lot more fun and was able to customize it to my kids so you know we got the exact story that you know was what they wanted and it was a lot of fun it was a ton of fun i've done a couple of those now so a lot of ways to use it but just as a homework assist is an amazing amazing tool all right so next one outside of chat gpt so the other one a little more structured if you're interested is this uh i don't even know how you say that schmoop i guess schmoop yeah, so a little more structured study aid. They have study guides on just about every subject that you can think of um, that are well done, professionally produced study guides. Uh, so that's a that's a nice one. That is a subscription service, but it's another good homework study 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 guide. Uh, maybe something that a student could use independently to to learn outside of school. I also I love uh, mind mapping. Uh, and brainstorming software. And I'll just show you, once again, show you a real life example. So I use it a lot for um, kind of concepting up stories. And so this was a story that I put together and you, you can see that I have all the, the characters. I have little, I just found images online to represent them to kind of help me and put their names, put their relationships with each other. Um, and all this stuff. And this became a game that I I, I had uh, my twins and then four of their friends and we ran a D&D &D adventure. And this was how, this was my my story yeah. that I, I put together for them. And so this was the, the school that they all went to. It was basically Harry Potter meets How to Train a Dragon. And, and they had a great time. It was a lot of fun. So this is a great tool for that. So if kids are doing in a creative writing class or they're putting together a history paper, I always recommend this is a great way to do that initial um, outline, if you will. You're creating an outline, but just you're making a visual. And the more you can pull in images, so if it's history and it's Teddy Roosevelt, you can pull in photos of the Rough Riders, right? And pull that into this. Uh, and, and I think that helps a lot to, to make your whatever you're writing, that book report, much more tangible and, and something that you can connect with. Um, another one, particularly for older students, is something like Evernote to keep all of your notes all in one place, all of your photos, all of your um, class notes, and it makes everything searchable. So you can suddenly have all your class notes be searchable and you can go and say, what did he say about XYZ? And then pull it up and it would pull in all your orders and you'd have all your transcripts all in the same place. So that's another cool tool that you might consider for older students just to have that um, executive function and, and organizational skills that they, they may need help or support with. 
So that's a lot of tools. There are probably a lot more. Um, there are more that I even use, but I think I've given you a lot to chew on today. So I will end with this. This is a photo. Uh, I need to get an updated photo. This is a film of a few years ago. Um, but uh, this is this is why I do this. I've got four kids. Uh, they're all dyslexic. Um, they all, just like dad, have the same same basic profile, but they're all doing incredibly well. And I couldn't be more proud of them. And this is why I give talks like this um, to, to share this and, and hopefully um, help you guys either serve your, your, your own kids or your students and give them the best opportunity that they can have. And uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Eric. That was an awesome, beautiful family um, and awesome presentation. And I have to say, um, I also use ChatGPT to help me with my child's homework and the principal to my child's school is on right now. So sorry, Amanda. <laughs> Sometimes it is to tool. fact check the correct answer also. So, um, but mom's doing it. So it isn't totally cheating. So That's in right. terms of questions, guys, we don't actually have any. Um, if you want to throw any qu last minute questions in oh, chat. I, I see somebody raising their hand over here. Lisa? Yeah, I think there's a few questions in the chat. I didn't see them. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll read them real quick. Yeah. <laughs> How did I miss that? So um, someone asked, they said, my middle school students tell me they're embarrassed to use their accommodations. The speech to text is the hardest one for them to use because they don't want to talk out loud. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, that's tough. That's tough. I, I can understand in the classroom itself being a little nervous to use it. Now, obviously, text to speech, just use headphones, right? No big deal. Um, and the Dictation side of it in a classroom can be disruptive. With my with my personally with my kids, um, they do use it in the classroom, and so we we had a meeting with their teachers um, and and specifically discussed a strategy for creating a way that they could use dictation in the classroom that would be successful. So they they've got a little bit of a separate table that they can go over to when they want to do dictation. Um, now, you know, we, we have the advantage of going to a private school, so they're accommodating with those types of requests. Um, and, and, but that's what, that's the way we handled it as parents is, is, you know, the kids were young enough, they weren't needing to advocate for themselves at their middle school as well, when we were had that conversation. And we just uh, talked to the teacher and the teacher got it, got it set up. And now they com very comfortably do their dictation during school and, and don't mind doing it. Um, so someone also commented that their son uses um, earbuds with a mic so it stands out less. Um, yep. Also, I know that it's not easy necessarily for every child, but one of the things that I tell parents is that when you start teaching them to advocate from themselves for themselves at a really young age, it becomes more um, comfortable and commonplace for them. So, um, you know, but every child is so different. It's really impossible to be able to say that that is the way what's going to work, right? Each personality is so different. So I see well, a question from Sophie. I could not agree more just to reinforce that self-advocacy piece. So uh, such important skill to teach early. So <laughs> good, good comment there. Yeah, and I go over just for everyone to know, um, my children have, um, some of my children have accommodations. We also sit down and review them twice a year so that they remember, so that they know what to advocate for. So, um, Sophie, if you have a question. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for doing this. This is my first time, and my son was recently diagnosed with uh, dyslexia, so it's, um, we just had the R, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's very, very comforting because, you know, I'm still a little emotional about it. Um, I want to ask, um, what was, was it an app or was it on, um, on a Mac computer? There was, um, it wasn't the audio. It was um, where you can highlight the text and it will read it for you. But I missed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where was, on, on what, was it an app or was it a, on a it, computer feature? It's it's a it's a built-in feature. It's a default feature uh, on the Mac, which is 
which makes it so great. So yeah, when I go in here to the settings, uh, I'll, I'll go to accessibility and then under accessibility, I go to spoken content and then you turn on speech selection right here and you in, let me see where, where's my setup of, a sh there we go. And then I hit that little I next to speak selection and it allows me to set up my keyboard shortcut. That's a critical piece to this, is setting up the keyboard shortcut. Um, and that's easy to miss, is that eye right there, because you might not see that, and you would go, how do I how do I do this? So I hit the eye, and then I click my keyboard shortcut. Good Thank question. Uh, mask one more. <laughs> so like everything is new for, um... You mentioned uh, Megan about reviewing the accommodations with the ch the well. In this case, will be my child. Uh -huh. um, oh, you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. You're good. Is that like once a year you recommend that? Uh, I mean, I think it really depends the age of the child and how many accommodations. It's it ten. Um, uh -huh. So. You know, the older the child, and the more prone they will be um, to. Mm -hmm feeling comfortable advocating for themselves or, you know, like mm -hmm. I have a first grader who has accommodations. We just talk about them more often than sit down and formally review them mm -hmm. so that he's just familiar with what he can ask for as a first grader, much less likely to ask. And um, I feel a lot of comfort in the teacher that she's like, you know, in lockstep with me. But for my middle schooler, it's a very different situation. So we do formally sit down with his plan. We um, review the accommodation so that he just knows that they're there. And I do it twice a year or just whenever it comes up. It doesn't have to be something that you count, you know, set on your calendar, but just trying to remember to touch in with him so that he, um, he remembers and he knows. Now, whether or not he's going to go up and do something about it is another story um, mm -hmm. because he's not the personality of Mr. You know, front of the room. Uh, Eric, I feel like your personality, you know, you have a lot of confidence um, that was lending to a lot of that. Obviously, you grew that with age, right? Um, but well, my son is broken you. into his. So. Let, let's be let's be really clear. I didn't was not um, gifted with with the confidence to stand in front of the room. You're right today. Um, that's certainly one of my gifts, but as a specifically a middle school student, I was incredibly shy and introverted and terrified, literally terrified of other people. I had a great deal of social anxiety. And so I had to, uh, develop that, um, that skill. And it came kind of later in high school. I started getting out of my shell, um, so, but interestingly, even in middle school, though, I did like to do plays. I love to get on stage and do performances. So it was there, but I just didn't ha know how to harness it in all those situations yet. Well, and Sophie, just one last comment to you. I know you said that you're new to this. Um, just realize that there is a huge community around to support you and lift you up. Um, so tap into as many resources as possible. I always think Facebook groups pertaining to dyslexia, especially in your area, can be um, a great place to crowdsource and just kind of gain under more understanding and confidence with your journey and your child's journey. So, all right, Lisa, did you see any other questions that I missed? I do. I, I saw a couple more. Go for um, it. <laughs> we had um, any suggestions for a child with a severe speech disorder along with dyslexia? The speech to text is not an option because of the speech, but child's having a lot of issues with writing and spelling. Yeah, I don't know if I'm 100% qualified to speak on that. I, there are probably people in this room that would know more. I would certainly get them into speech therapy. Um, my kids uh, took speech therapy, and I think it was very helpful, particularly uh, one of my twins has a speech issue, and uh, having him in speech therapy has helped him with his articulation. So uh, I don't know how to fix dictation right now uh, with that, but but that would be my first thing is speech therapy. I, um, I also wish that I had great um, advice when it came to assistive technology, but I will use this audience to share something that a lot of people don't realize. Um, dyslexia, 
uh, or any language processing disorder along with speech, it all occurs in the same area of the brain. So something that people don't recognize a lot of times is you have your neurobiological and origin dyslexia, but then you also have um, what, you know, characteristics of dyslexia, I guess you could say, as a result of um, a previous speech impairment on any level. So 75% um, of kids who prior to reading instruction needed to have any kind of speech intervention are the ones that we're really looking closely at um, for reading troubles. So it is a really common overlap. That's not an answer to your question, but I think it's really something that more people need to widely understand that there's kind of two roads into the same um, trouble, trouble area. Um, I think, oh, somebody asked, how do you feel about C pens? C pens? Oh yeah, I own one. Um, I think they're okay. I think they're okay. I, I own one. I basically never use it because the, um, the Prismo Go app is so far superior to the C pen. Um, so, I mean, I, I like the concept a lot. Uh, I, but they, 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 they don't work quite fast enough for me. When I scan across a page, it takes a second for the C pen to catch up and then read it to me. And then I got to go to the next line. So for me, that's a hindrance to my comprehension. If I'm trying to read a paragraph, the C pen is most effective if I need to read like two or three words, or maybe I want to, I have, I have reading myself, but I get stuck on a word. And then I want to use the C pen to get through one challenging word. That would be more the use case for the C pen. Awesome. All right. So I bought multiple in my life, by the way. And they're always like two or three hundred dollars, and I keep buying the newest, latest, greatest model in hopes that it's going to be awesome. So I have a lot of experience with it. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, because we are about to hit seven forty-five, I actually am going to. Um, Thank Eric. Um, thank you guys also all for attending. I apologize for any technical issues we again had with the website. Hopefully we were able, you were able to get that email. We will be emailing out um, the recording tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. hopefully to kind of in small batches. So it doesn't go to junk mail, but if you do see it um, or if you don't receive it, please check your junk mail. Someone did ask Eric if they could have a copy of the slides. So um, if you don't mind sharing that, you can send it to me and we can attach it into the email out. Um, I'll do that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all, everyone, for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And Eric, thank you so much for that awesome, com like compacted, um, hour-long presentation on how we can help these kids. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Best of luck in your journeys. Everybody is going to be really successful. I know it. I can feel Thank it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good night.